Department over in California, half hour, real one. It is almost summer, 1972. The spring had been dry in the southwest. But for most, the rains had come and gone, leaving the air of the cities for a moment clear. And the plains tall with wheat. Though some cities of the north had not lost their chill, the seasons had changed. But some things had not. Waves of planes and helicopters, both American and South Vietnamese, in this presidential election year, much of the news was not new, not to this man. A decade ago, he had said this war was America's most tragic mistake. Yet it continued, in spite of all he had done. Perhaps this year would be different. It appears that Senator McGovern has taken the state by a margin of something like two to one, probably a little better. It was his third victory in as many months. Amidst the joy of his triumph that night, some who had failed to predict his success saw what a remarkable adventure it had been. We are witnessing, one reporter said, a new political phenomenon. Clearly something was happening in the country, and this man was at its center. Tuesday night, is getting to be the happiest night of the week. We're going to give Richard Nixon the retirement he so richly deserves. We're going to make America the great and good country that we know it can be. I think tonight that we're going to go on from here to win this nomination. He was to win more victories after that night, and the questions that began with his success would continue. Who was this man? And why did people believe in him so? He was christened George Stanley McGovern. Birthplace, Avon, South Dakota. He grew up in Mitchell and started school there. But the more important lessons were learned at home. From his mother, a gentle spirit, and from his father, Christian principles and hard work. His father had spent his boyhood in the Illinois coal country, where the 14-hour days were measured out at 10 cents a bucket. But he found time to read the scriptures and decided to abandon the mine for the pulpit. In 1899, he was ordained a minister. He chose to serve those who were immigrating to America to seek a better life. He followed them west, and while they fashioned a new existence from the prairie, he began building churches. Reverend McGovern built his last church in Mitchell when George was five. As a boy, George had his father's love of history, but he would not be spared the troubles of his own time. The memory would remain with him all his life of what they had suffered, of seeing strong men weep, and he talked about it often to his old friend, historian Leonard Jenlin. I can remember him talking about the hardships of the children in the community in which he lived as a boy and uh, how it seemed that uh, people were fine people and yet were so oppressed economically. I think this struck him personally. Things shouldn't be the way they are. People should be able to live better than they were living. I remember these conversations. There is a, there is a closeness perhaps to, to the soil. If you are close to the soil, if you're close to the rivers and the rocks and the mountains and the peaks, if you have worked with your hands with the people who have gone through the, the, the problems that the people went through in the middle border, uh, if you are at all a sensitive person, and uh, George is a sensitive person, then you develop a feeling, 
uh, for this heritage, and I think this uh, impels you. This somewhat motivates you. At Mitchell High, George was a good student and a top debater. It was a time for searching conversation and a few youthful attractions, like the Stegerberg twins from Woonsocket, Ilya and Eleanor. It was Eleanor he decided to marry, but the year was 1941. He chose to serve in the air, spent 15 months earning his wings, and went back to marry the girl from Woonsocket. A brief leave served for a honeymoon, and they said goodbye in Topeka, Kansas. His unit was the 455th Bomb Group, 15th Air Force, flying B-24s out of Fosia, Italy. Their targets were the oil refineries and munition plants of Nazi Germany. But the cost was high. Many of his comrades would not survive. Some of the men who followed him into combat would survive and remember. Men like waste gunner Bill McAfee. We just dropped our bombs over Brux, Germany. Number two engine was hit, and then we had trouble with number three. We had a fire in number three engine. We had to try and feather the prop, but it wouldn't feather. At this time, we were over the Adriatic, and we were prepared to ditch. And then the navigator spotted a fighter landing strip in Yugoslavia, but it was awfully short. But rather than take a chance on ditching, George chose to go in there anyway for the safety of the crew. As far as we were concerned, the crew, there was, uh, there was no one better than George McGovern. He finished his tour outwardly unscathed, but his pride in receiving the distinguished flying cross was tempered by the haunting knowledge of its human cost. In 1945, his military service would come to an end. Having seen the destruction of war, he chose to build his future on the acts of peace. He began, like his father, in the pulpit. But his love of history exerted a stronger pull, and he returned to the classroom. Eleanor, of course, went along, and by now there were a couple of new faces to feed. The rooming house they lived in still stands, 710 Crock Street in Evanston. One of George's friends recalled later that on the GI Bill, $30 a week, they all had to skimp and save pennies. It was not, Eleanor said, an ideal place for raising two small children. But we were young and our friends all shared the same low budgets and high hopes. George had begun his studies with an eye to teaching. But his interest in politics was beginning to come to the front. His studies brought him a deepening sense of history and the legacy men of principle had left. Fellow student Bill Towner recalls the McGovern of that time. I think that the series of decisions he made after getting out of World War II and being sickened by the bombing and the slaughter were all linked to his desire to provide the kind of leadership which he recognized had to be a kind of moral leadership. I think it gave him a purpose, a direction, and led him, first of all, into the ministry, secondly, into history, and thirdly, into politics. His journey into politics began with what many said was an impossible task, for he set out alone to build a Democratic Party in the most Republican state in the Union. Week after week, he traveled his state in a borrowed Chevrolet, sometimes driving a hundred miles to convince one person that his was the party of change. And though his critics said he was headed nowhere, by 1956, he had a different destination in mind he became the first Democratic congressman from his state in 20 years. And he went to work in a way that won him respect in Washington and re-election at home. 
Then, in 1961, he was called to serve at the side of a new president with a new idea. Food for peace. Hunger is the companion of communism, said George McGovern. So he organized food for peace as a war against hunger. For he saw America's agricultural abundance was freedom's first line of defense. For 18 months, their fight for life was his fight. And his victories, even his small ones, were full of satisfaction. By 1962, he could report to the president that America's security lay not only in its military power, but in its ability to bring an end to suffering abroad. He invited the young president from Massachusetts to come home with him, to see the promise for himself. Governor Guy, to recently my associate at the White House, George McGovern. Ladies and gentlemen, these are dams, these great projects, frequently are statistics to those of us who work in the nation's capital. And I must say that I am heartened to come out here and talk to the distinguished engineer in charge and be informed by him that this has cost $25 million less than was estimated eight years ago, and that stands as some kind of a record in the United States today. We're going to take him back to Washington and put him in charge of the whole operation. Now. <laughs> By the end of this century, we're going to have 300 million people and a $2 trillion national income and a great responsibility as the food basket of a world which will double its population in the next 40 years. Let us develop the resources of our land, build up all its great institutions, and see whether we, in our time and generation, may not perform something worthy to be remembered. In 1962, he entered the Senate. From the beginning, he made it clear where he would stand. A senator, he said, should always follow the dictates of his conscience, regardless of the popularity of his position. His manner won him the respect of his colleagues, both of another generation and another party. In the places where policy was being made, his quiet and reasoned voice came to be valued by those in power. His colleagues came to know what his constituents already knew, that he was a man of principle, whose word and judgment could be trusted. Of all the men in the United States Senate, said Robert Kennedy, George McGovern does things in the most decent way. They were good times, Eleanor would remember. The children were old enough to share the excitement of our life, she said. We were happy and together. But the quiet they knew now was not to last for events in another place were preparing to intervene. Ten years ago, he would write, we are making a mistake, the most tragic diplomatic and moral mistake of our history. The year was 1963. Having been touched by war himself, he saw this conflict was different. I've never regretted, he said, my service as a bomber pilot in World War II. But I do not believe that Vietnam is that kind of testing ground of freedom. I cannot remain silent in the face of what I regard as a policy of madness. Though his words were heard, they were not heeded. But the courage of his stand won him the respect of many, including those in the Senate who opposed him. There's 
nobody in the Senate that had it matched George McGovern's high level of, of dialogue on the Vietnam question. When George first came out on this, it was far from the popular side. He had to decide where he was going to stand. He took that stand and, and took it with great courage. And this is the thing you respect. It was obvious conviction and belief. And uh, even at the expense of whatever it might do to him at home. And I think this is a measure of, of great public character. And he certainly has it. What do you eat? What do you eat? I mean, what are the meals that you have? Under this white man has done... This. The acts of conscience that had earned the respect of his opponents brought a closeness and a commitment from those who shared his cause. Politics is the greatest of adventure. He has made it such, and also given it the highest standard. And therefore, it's the kind of person. There are Republicans and there are Democrats who are those kind of people. But George McGovern happens to be the kind of person that those of us who are colleagues of his in the United States Senate can be proud. And the United States of America can be proud that he's in public life. The long, dark days of 1968. The death of his friend left a void in the country and in the cause they had shared together. Many asked, was it all to end like this? There was a great sadness in Chicago. It was as if the sacrifices of this violent age had been for nothing. Amidst the emotion of those days, few voices of reason were to emerge. But one who did spoke not of tragedy, but of hope, of an America that could reach across its troubles and become one nation again. But this was not their convention. Over 700 of the delegates were elected over two years prior to the convention. The minority groups were in very poor numbers. There was uh, hardly any representation of the young or women. And over 60% of the delegates were over 50 years of age. They were the people who had made the largest contributions. The old process had triumphed in Chicago, perhaps for the last time because there were some at this convention who knew if the party was to survive, it had to reform. Men like Harold Hughes of Iowa. We brought to the floor of the convention a resolution to review and make recommendations regarding the delegate selection process for nominating a president in the Democratic Party. The National Committee chairman then named the members of that committee and named the chairman of that committee, who was Senator George McGovern of South Dakota. Senator McGovern then uh, led the way, and we held a series of hearings in every region of the country in relationship to the needs of the party and opening up the party processes. The requirements that were laid down by McGovern Commission were that everyone should be fairly represented in the party process. I guess you'll look back on this movement as a major breakthrough in the party structures in America, I think, because the status quo of I am the king and I will name the delegates had come to an end. But there was another status quo in America which had not come to an end. In the cities, he found the real harvest of our neglect was bitterness and despair. But as he traveled our land, he saw in the malnutrition and hunger of millions of our children an even greater tragedy. For he knew the cost of this human waste was borne by us all. And he spoke out against the misordered priorities that squandered our taxes and destroyed so many of our children. For every dollar we fail to spend wisely now, he said, we will spend four times that amount on our prisons and welfare rolls. He saw other wounds in the country, and they disturbed him as deeply, for they were, in their own way, equally unfair. Well, I just lost my husband, and we had a terrific income, but it all went taking care of him now, yeah. and I 
I'm really down to nothing. And I can't go to school for the rest of my life. And my folks aren't going to support me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And there ain't no jobs open. The greater imperative is to get the drugs out of the neighborhoods. This gets down to, the, to our crime rate. And the guy who's given up trying to make a buck and goes out and holds somebody up, he gets put in jail. We support him. He died. They found him in his room. This is American veteran. I got to pay 20% of what I earn the taxes, whereas some of the major industries in the country only got to pay uh, under 10%. If you listen to a newscast, he tells the uh, you got 6% of the national workforce out on unemployment. Next one, six and you a half. You find out three cents has been added on this, five cents on that. Before you know you pay, well, you may as well pay the money for right. the meat. Right. They make more profits working me 11 hours or 12 hours a day than they do working three shifts eight hours a day because right. they don't have to pay any kind of human benefit. The farmer is not getting out of his product what he should have. I think it's a crime. The farmer's getting squeezed off. I'm not one of these feminists that, that go around shouting all this stuff. I just want what's fair for us. There should be something done so each individual would benefit from the life he spends on this earth. Just to work in a plant all those years to get your pension benefits. And then that, that's, that's the end of your life. It just seems so ridiculous and, and uh, unrewarding is really the word for it, unrewarding. I love the United States, but uh, I love it enough so I want to see some changes made. The American people want to believe in their government. They want to believe in their country. And I'd like to be one of those that provides the kind of leadership that would help restore that kind of faith. I don't say I can do it alone. Of course I can't. But the president can help set a new tone in this country. He can help raise the vision and the faith and the hope of the American people. And that's what I'd like to try to do. I'd like to get a president that we can believe in. I now seek the presidency as a public servant whose career... His announcement, a year before everyone else, was not, in the words of one reporter, a prospect that brought fear to the hearts of the opposition. But perhaps what George McGovern was saying that day was heard more clearly in other rooms. They were, in the most part, unpaid volunteers, determined in 1972 to make the process work. In a time when the elections depended on the secret contributions of a few, his campaign would be financed in a different way. We don't have special interest contributing to the McGovern campaign. The money has come in contributions of $5, $10, $15. One man wrote a letter and said, uh, we'll eat bologna and hot dogs for a while in order to uh, contribute another $5 a month to the campaign. Now, that kind of support makes a candidate feel that he has a real obligation to the people. He often walked the campaign trail alone, little known by the voters and often ignored by the press. But slowly the people came to know why he was there and why he would continue. We want to try to fix things up so life is better for these two. Right, thanks a lot. That's all I can have. The first time I spoke against Vietnam, my son uh, was then nine years old. Uh, he's now 19 and, and faced with the draft. It never occurred to me when I started speaking out against that war that it would someday catch my own son 10 years later. He had a way of personalizing the truth that bridged the differences between people, and they believed him. On the minds of, of young and old alike, Slowly, even the national press sensed that something was happening, something new in American politics. They began to listen to this man and note what he had to say. His opponents, too, took note of his appeal and struck out at him, often with interesting results. Is that short on campaign material? I think that I should give him something for tomorrow and, uh, uh, and tell him when I was 12 years old I stole a watermelon. He was on the move. Within two months, he had eliminated the front runner, and the power brokers began to see that the people were not to be denied. Not this time. 
Everywhere he campaigned, the victories he had sought so long began to appear. And if there was joy in the mounting momentum of his success, he would share it with Eleanor, for they had made this journey of 30 years together. Perhaps he would find in the memory of their path a way out of the wilderness for us all. If you grow up out in the Great Plains, you have to live with the philosophy that next year is going to be better. You can't survive any other way. And maybe that's the way it is with life. You have to be an optimist to really get the most out of life. If people laugh about that relationship between a, a person and the land, they say it's an old-fashioned idea. It's really not, because first of all, it gives you a sense of knowing where you're from. Uh, if you don't have some frame of reference that's familiar and acceptable to you, it's hard to go into a complicated area like uh, one of the great cities of this country and know what needs to be done. What needs to be done is to deal with the simple, ordinary problems of people, the houses they live in, the kind of health care they get, the uh, neighborhoods they live in, so that you really build, again, a sense of caring about each other. That's what's important. This country was conceived by men who had a dream of human dignity and justice and concern for each other. And if we begin now to match our policies with our ideals, then I believe it is yet possible that we will come to admire this country not simply because we were born here, but because of the kind of great and good land that you and I want it to be and that together we have made it. That is my hope, that is my reason for seeking the presidency of the United States. <laughs>